The second part of this lesson will leverage what we just discussed, which was fairly abstract, and we'll talk about the history of concurrency and parallelism in Java. And some of this you may know, if you're, if you're a Java programmer, some of this might be familiar. Some of it will almost certainly not be uh, what you know because it's fairly new or, or fairly not well articulated by the mass programming community yet. And then I'll also spend some time, now that we're going to talk about the actual mechanisms, you see there's a whole bunch of different things you could choose in Java, trying to give you some sense of what to choose and when and why. Because that, whenever you have alternatives, half the battle is knowing which ones to pick. So let's talk about Java real quick. So Java has had support for concurrency since the very beginning. So when Java came out in the mid-90s, it already had support for threads. We talked about a Java thread. And it also had support for built-in monitor objects, which we very quickly talked about. So that's been around for a long time. The focus in the early days of Java was on very basic multi-threading and very basic synchronization primitives. So if you take a look at this link, you'll learn about some of those things. So you've got a bunch of threads. You can have these synchronizers to let them coordinate their interactions. Here's a very simple example. So this is my simple blocking queue example. This is actually a, a refinement of the buggy queue example we talked about before. Remember, buggy queue intentionally had bugs, so it would have race conditions. This solution does not have race conditions. And what we do is we make ourselves a queue that's a simple blocking bounded queue. And then we share that queue between a producer object and a consumer object. And the producer and consumer objects run in two separate threads. So we allocate two separate threads. And they communicate through this bounded buffer that's thread safe. And then this code can be used to start both threads. So now they're off running concurrently. And then we can basically have the same code wait for both threads to finish. And the program will complete and should work correctly because we have properly synchronized it. <clears throat> if you were to look at the simple blocking bounded queue implementation, which you can see here, you'll see it uses very simple Java 1.0 synchronizer mechanisms like synchronized statements and various coordinator mechanisms like wait and notify all in order to be able to have the threads take turns adding and removing things from the queue, putting and taking things from the queue. This approach is very efficient. There's not a lot going on. It can be implemented efficiently at the hardware level using hardware-centric operations that come out of the box on most chipsets these days. However, it's very low level and very limited in capability. In particular, there are lots of accidental complexities. Accidental complexities are problems that arise due to limitations with the software techniques, platforms, tools, and methods that we use. So Java 1.0 concurrency support is very accidentally complex because you can do silly things, and you can forget to put locks in the right place, and you can have deadlock, and race conditions, and memory inconsistencies. And uh, you also have to spawn the threads. You have to remember to start them. You have to remember to join them. And it just becomes complicated. Because of the limitations with the first generation of Java, with Java 1.5, or JDK 5, which came out around the 2004 time frame, they added a whole pile of new concurrency and synchronization mechanisms. So we have this thing called the executor framework, various synchronizers, blocking queues, atomics, concurrent collections, and so on. Uh, most of which we will not cover at all in this course. That's, that's for the spring course. So those are some really cool things. The person who wrote most of that stuff is a friend of mine named Doug Lee. I'll reference him throughout the course because he's got lots of great material to learn from that I'll point you to. And he also wrote most of the implementations. And it's all very brilliant, um, but complicated. So the, the focus in Java 1.5 was on coarse-grained coarse -grained task parallelism, which you can read about here, where you can have computations run concurrently in pools of threads. So there are features like the, the executor service, the executor completion service, where you can submit tasks, which are these things that are runnables or callables. We've talked a bit about runnables and callables. You'll learn more about them a little bit more, but not a whole lot more in this class. We'll cover them more in the spring. They get submitted. They get put up into queues. Threads in a pool of threads pull the runnables or the callables off the queues and run them. And then when they're done, they place the results into other queues. And then programs can get the results by accessing and taking them from the queue. That's the basic idea of the executor framework and executor completion service in Java 1.5. There's a little program you can run here as an example called the Palantiri Manager application. If you take my course in the spring, you will, you will overdose on 
various ways to do the Palantiri Manager application. It's, it's a really cool example of things. This particular example spawns a pool of threads, a fixed size pool of threads. They all go off and gaze into Palantiri. Anybody know what a Palantir is? Any Tolkien fans? So if you've ever watched Lord of the Rings, there's this magic seeing stone that you can gaze into and communicate. And uh, so this example emulates that. It's very geeky, but a cool example of concurrency. And uh, we have things like cyclic barriers that can be used to, to mediate access to the threads and how they run. We can execute stuff and so on and so forth. So these are some of the cool features you can get in Java 1.5. Java 1.5 concurrency mechanisms are very feature rich, very optimized, but they are somewhat tedious and error prone to program. So it's easy to get things wrong once again. Flash forward to 2010 ish timeframe. That's when Java 1.7 came out. And they added support in Java 1.7 for something called the fork join framework or the fork join pool framework. And this added support for foundational parallelism. The fork join framework supports this fine-grained data parallelism, kind of like we talked about before, where you have a big task that you can explicitly split into subtasks by forking. You'll learn more about forking soon. Those things can then run concurrently on multiple threads, map to the different processor cores, and then the results are all joined together at the end. So it's basically that fork join model just realized in Java, and it's called data parallelism. And uh, Here's an example, if you want to see an example of using the fork join pool, and we'll talk more about this shortly because that's what your next assignment's going to be about after we're done with assignment one. We have a uh, fork join pool called the common fork join pool. I'll talk more about what that is later, which searches input strings to locate phrases that match. And so it searches all the works of Shakespeare to find phrases and uh, is a real fun example, and it illustrates how the fork join pool can be used. Very, very powerful as you will discover when you write the code. But you will also discover that it's a bit tedious to program because you have to do the splitting. You have to do the forking. You have to figure out how to get the results back together again. You have to do the joining. So it's, it's powerful, but it requires a lot of human interaction. So maybe not the easiest thing to use at scale. Therefore, with Java 1.8, which came out in 2014, they finally said, aha, let's, let's take our cool parallelism framework, which is very cool, and let's make it easier to program. And how are we going to do that? We're going to combine the functional programming features we talked about to enable data parallelism and reactive asynchrony. This example here is data parallelism. And you'll get a chance to play around with this later. Uh, this is something called parallel streams, which uses some magic like splitterators and collectors and so on to split a big problem up into subproblems and then process those subproblems through streams of filters and uh, aggregate operations that, that map and manipulate the flow of data through them in parallel. And then they collect all the results together into a final result at the end. So that's data parallels. And you get a lot of a chance to play with that. Really, really cool. And then they also provide support in Java 8 for something called reactive asynchrony, or what we refer to as the completable futures framework. And you will also get lots of chance to play with that. And that, this model here, as we'll see, the, the uh, data parallelism model that we have here is basically syntactic sugar around the fork join framework. So once you understand what fork join does, that you add streams around it, and it just makes it easier to access the fork join framework capabilities. But it's still kind of in the same vein as the fork join pool. Reactive asynchrony is a totally different paradigm altogether. It's, really, really, really cool, but it requires rethinking a lot of the way that you do programming, because it's all about asynchronous operations and handling the completion of asynchronous operations. And it really kind of requires you to stand on your head to understand it. But it's really cool. And it, in many cases, it's actually extremely efficient, even more efficient than the parallel streams approach for reasons we'll talk about later in the course. Uh, if you've ever programmed with JavaScript and you've used their promises capabilities, that's sort of what this does, but a lot cooler. Here's an example of a little example of data parallelism. This small snippet of code will synchronously download images from a list of URLs. And if the images are not already cached, it'll download them. And it'll go ahead and apply 
various filters to transform the images in parallel and then store them into the file system on the local device. And we'll talk about this example. It's called the image stream gang example. It's really cool. And once you understand what it's doing, it's really simple to read what this code does. You say, take a list of URLs and run everything in parallel. Get rid of the ones that we've already um, downloaded. Download the ones we haven't downloaded. Go ahead and apply filter transformations to modify the images in some way. And then take the results and store them into a list. So it's really cool because the computational behavior is expressed almost one-to-one -one with the domain intent. Right? So once you know how to read this code, you just go, oh, I know exactly what this is doing. And you're saying what to do, not how to do it. Remember that discussion about the problem with imperative programming is you have to say too many things. But with declarative programming, you just say what you want done, and the framework does it all for you. We'll also spend some time much later in the course walking through how all this stuff actually works under the hood. So I will give you at least a high-level view of what happens internally. If you're really curious and want to see how it works, you can always download the source code and, and peek around in the source code. It's, all the streams code is in the Java util streams package or folder in the source code. It's, it's pretty crazy, but it's very interesting. Here is the same program, except this time it uses reactive asynchrony via completable futures. This is also using a stream. Notice before we were using a parallel stream. Now we're using just a good old sequential stream. However, all the things that are taking place here are running asynchronously. So we're asynchronously checking to see if stuff has been downloaded. We are asynchronously downloading the stuff that has not already been downloaded. We are asynchronously applying the filters, and so on and so forth. And so we'll get a chance to learn about how all these neat things work as we get later in the course. And it's very powerful. You can do asynchronous programming in ways that actually often scale up much better than doing synchronous programming because of the properties of asynchrony and how they work nicely with modern hardware, which inherently is asynchronous. Uh, so synchrony is kind of a, a facade we put on top of what is essentially asynchronous under the hood. So the closer your program maps to the hardware, the faster it's going to, going to perform. OK. As we will see over and over and over again throughout the rest of the course as we talk about this stuff, the goal is to tr try to strike an effective balance between human productivity, that's like you and me writing code without taking enormous amounts of time, and computer performance. Obviously, if you wrote all your code in assembly language and you knew what you were doing, uh, it would probably be very fast. But it would take you forever, and it would be full of bugs. Um, conversely, if you wrote all your code sequentially in uh, some super high-level language like Excel macros or something like that, uh, or MATLAB, it might be very productive, but it probably wouldn't run as fast as you would like. So Java 8 is kind of trying to find the trade-off between performance and productivity. One of the downsides between all these cool advanced parallelism frameworks, however, is they can be overly prescriptive. So if your problem maps into the kind of solution they provide, life is great. But it can also be somewhat of a Procrustean bed, for those of you who either know Greek mythology or have read the Percy Jackson books. Procrustean bed means trying to force fit something in a way that doesn't really work. And therefore, you have to, make, you have to cut corners or cut off legs or something like that in order to make things fit. So that, of course, leads to the last topic, which we can probably get through in a few minutes before we're done. Now that we've got all these different approaches, which one should you apply and when should you apply them? The first thing to notice is there's a, a lot of layers in a modern Java platform. And there's a lot of layers in modern platforms in general, Java being one example. So you've got the operating system kernel. You've got the system libraries written in C or C++. You've got some kind of execution environment, like a virtual machine or an ahead of time compiled environment. You've got libraries written in higher level languages like Java that handle concurrency and parallelism. You've got additional application frameworks that handle all the other stuff you've got to do, like location awareness or database operations or window management or synchronization of state across uh, a mobile device to the cloud, and so on and so forth, notification systems. And then finally, on the top, you've got your applications. So you know, which of these things should you apply, and when should you apply them? If you're trying to build performance-sensitive applications, like a gaming system, for example, you may want to stick with the shared object mechanisms I mentioned. They're very low level, but they're also very fast. And if you watch this video by my friend Doug Lee, he'll explain more about that. 
The good part is that these mechanisms are very lightweight, they're very efficient. The downside is they're tedious and error prone because you have all the accidental complexities of programming at lower level stuff. So that's one consideration. If you're building frameworks that you want other people to use, right, you're kind of at this level, then you might want to use Java's message passing mechanisms, which allow you to pass messages between threads. So the Java Executor Completion Service, the Java Executor Service are examples of frameworks that use these lower level mechanisms, like message passing. Android's Async Task and Hammer frameworks leverage these message passing mechanisms. So if you're building frameworks, that may be the thing for you. It's very, they're very flexible, they're very decoupled, but there's a little over, extra overhead in them. Conversely, if you're building mobile apps, which we'll be doing in this course, you might want to see if you can use the higher level frameworks that come with Java 8 parallel streams, completable futures, Rx Java, and so on. Those are higher level ways of doing things. And this is actually a screenshot of the program that you'll be doing throughout the course, the image download program, the web crawler. The good thing is that these frameworks, if they fit your problem, are very productive, very robust. You don't have to deal with all the issues of locking, for example, that's handled for you. The downside is there might be some extra overhead and the bigger problem is they may be overly prescriptive. If your problem doesn't fit into the mechanisms they provide, you're kind of stuck in that Procrustean bed. Obviously, we've picked examples for the course where they're going to make a lot of sense, but that's not always the case. If you really aspire to be a full stack developer, which is sort of the holy grail these days, you'll need to understand all of this stuff. You'll have to understand how to do the shared object kind of processing, the message passing kind of processing and concurrency, the higher level frameworks, and so on. So in this class, we'll be focusing primarily on parallelism, uh, and that'll get you, you know, part of the pancake stack. But uh, if you're interested in this and want to learn more, in the spring, we'll cover a different part of the stack, kind of the, the lower level part of the stack. And we do the, we do the higher level part first because it's the way that the world is going. But for those of you who need a deeper understanding, we'll cover the later stuff in the spring. Okay, and that miraculously is the end of the lesson.